na, 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 na. Dog Wars. Yeah, I don't know why that just. I don't know why it popped into my dome like that. Cause it's good. I know, but the song like that's very that's so random. It's pretty <laughs> epic. Da, 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 da. You're epically ready for season two. That's what it is. That's exactly what it Cause is. Cause we're here. Cause we're here. Welcome to TikTok Theology, a podcast that tackles the major trending topics on social media that concern the Christian faith. I'm Megan. And I'm Steven. We know you can't form a theology in three minutes or less, but those videos can identify current issues. TikTok will give us the prompt and then we'll do a deep dive. Thanks for joining us in this exploration. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> That's my own sound effect, guys. Don't don't worry. That was all me. But we're back. Season two. We're getting ready. We're uh, so excited to be back with uh, TikTok theology. Season, Season two. two. Woo woo woo. I'm gonna have. We've got such great topics and got stuff lined up. A lot of good up. stuff in store. I'm so excited. I mean, season one went really well. Thank you, friends, for all who listened to us for all like mm-hmm. ten mm-hmm. episodes or whatever we put out. We're so excited to keep going. We're having a blast. <laughs> we also, um, we are repenting from our hypocrisy <laughs> and uh, being called TikTok theology and not having a TikTok, mm-hmm. but now we do. Yeah. So go check it out. <laughs> All the info is in the show notes. You can see it there, follow there and give a lot of good insight. Like what, what you want us to talk about, anything like that. We're going to, we're going to totally be involved in that. And so Megan is, uh, is, is on that. And, um, and also check it out on YouTube. We have all of them recorded there too. So that's super exciting. And we're going to treat, keep trying to grow. Yeah. We're going to try to do some video in the future and, yeah. um, and keep going there, but we want to hear from you guys. So any, any questions, any things, topics, any, um, ideas, merch ideas, whatever it is, let us know. And we're going to see what we can do. Yeah. We're excited to where this is going, mm-hmm. working on all of our social media, all fun stuff. We hopefully will get video going so for those of you who don't know what we look like we'll do if it's like a face reveal yeah there you go (laughs) for Uh, those of you who have only had trust in our voices mm -hmm. well you'll be able to put a face to the name what if if we're like look way different than they expect i don't know i i'm like at this point before we do it i do want to put on like our social media or something and be like loki what what do y'all think we look like (laughs) (laughs) there you go right well, I also wanted to say before we started, there was a special announcement. Uh, Megan got a new job Woo! at our university. Well, she got a, another job tacked onto the many things that she already does, <laughs> but it's a great job. So your title is, what's your, what's your new title? So I'm the content and support specialist for the compelling preaching grant with the School of Theology and Ministry. Awesome. So she gets to work um, alongside our buddy, Tim Lee, um, Jeff Toll. Um, I'll be popping in and out of, of cer- certain things, but basically she's part, she's a team member of our school now, Woo. which is uh, really awesome and, um, and well-deserved. So congratulations. I was really so much. for you to get that. And in the, in that spirit, I think that the best place to start season two mm-hmm. is to do a topic that is trending and mm-hmm. is pivotal. Mm-hmm. It also just so happens to be what you wrote your master's thesis on. It is, in fact, what I wrote my master's thesis on. So, uh, so Megan, why don't you take us away? Ta- what are we talking about today? All right, guys, this is one of those soapbox episodes. <laughs> one of those things that I could probably ramble on for forever. And just for those of you who, ca- who are interested, um, my dissertation will be in the show notes <laughs> if you want to read any more about what we're going to touch on today. Nice, you can put the whole thing in there. Put the whole thing, by all means. If you're going to wander through 56 pages of my hard work, <laughs> then I'm willing to offer it. But um, so today we're going to be talking about purity culture. Woo! Mm-hmm. Um, so for those of you who don't know, we're going to give a brief overview about purity culture real quick. And then obviously that's a trending topic I've seen, um, on social media, on TikTok, on Instagram, all the things, um, the concepts of modesty, all, uh, modest is hottest, all that good stuff, (laughs) um, kind of all plays into this conversation about Christian purity culture. Mm -hmm. And so purity culture obviously does not necessarily have one specific definition because it depends on kind of who you're talking to um, and in what context they come from. But yeah. generally, purity culture came out of a movement in the like late 90s, early 2000s, uh, primarily. That was very much a push towards... Um, it was the Christian effort <laughs> to push towards um, let's not have premarital sex, let's save sex till marriage. And it was kind of in response to a lot of rising like teen pregnancy rates, um, to a lot of rising STDs and STI rates, stuff like that, that were coming up a lot in the 90s and early 2000s. 
And this out of came like a, a true love waits is this kind of movement and birthed bir- the virginity and abstinence pledges. It birthed the yeah. um, <laughs> the purity, purity rings. rings. Yeah. Um, it birthed all of the different stuff that actually became pretty mainstream. Like at a point, there were very famous people like a Disney Channel actors. Jonas a lot. Brothers. The Jonas Brothers, Miley Cyrus, like Demi Lovato, all of them for a while were very publicly making these pledges of purity and that they were like, we're not going to have sex till marriage, that kind of stuff. Um, we see how that turned out, but um, <laughs> that was a huge movement at one point in the yeah. church and um, even outside of the church. But the, obviously the Christian community gripped onto this mm-hmm. with two with two hands. <laughs> they were excited to hear this news. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, I was not so much <laughs> raised in purity culture. I was born in 2001. So I was a, I'm a kid of, of parents and pastors and leaders who this was how they were raised and what they were taught to believe in regards to sex and sexuality and, and premarital sex, yeah. marriage, all that kind of stuff. So, but before we hop into it, Stephen, do you have anything to speak to about someone who was around and kicking <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and was experiencing this as a teenager, as a yeah. mm-hmm. young adult, that kind of stuff? Yeah. So I was born in 1985. And uh, so this oh, is definitely oh, my, oh. man, that's, that's, a, that's a great age. <laughs> that is a great age. 1985. I experienced the 80s, 90s. Is there a 90s. song? Is there a song? I, 19, uh, 1985. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't know. Oh, maybe. okay. Maybe. But the point is I had all, like, you only dream about the 80s. I, I do. lived in it. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You, you only dream about the 90s. Y'all just be trying to emulate our style. That is us. <laughs> You know what I mean? Anyways, yeah, I hear uh, you. <laughs> I'm proud. Credit I'm, where credit is due. I'm proud of my millennialness. There you go. Um, but uh, yeah, no, we totally uh, grew up in it. And it, it seemed normal, I think, for teenagers growing up in that and like or middle schoolers, teenagers, because a lot of the ideas there seemed like they were biblical. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something we're going to talk about is like, it's like some of, I mean, it's, it's related yeah. to scripture. It's mm-hmm. related to, but like the way it was particularly defined, mm-hmm. the, the purity laws that they were actually bringing was, it was a very, you know, uh, reactionary American account, like kind yeah. of Western account of certain things that were in scripture. Yeah. And so I think what happens with a lot of millennials, you know, as they, as they date, get married and stuff like that, I think any, any dealing with like a sexual ethics, there's a lot of shame and guilt involved, uh, confusion yeah. involved um, whenever you're dealing with any of that kind of stuff. And probably just for in general, mm-hmm. but a little more compounded. It became, it's, it was um, it was an extremely central issue in a lot of youth group stuff and, yeah. and certain things. And, uh, and, you know, I was a youth pastor too. Now I hardly preached about purity and sexuality. Yeah. I was always like a theologian in training. So like, Oh, of course. Yeah. So I, my, my, were always like very gospel oriented, theologically rich and, and stuff like that. My sermons, yeah. but we did talk about it for sure. Mm-hmm. Like you're a youth pastor. You have to. And it was always the, um, the, Hey, you need to wait till you're married. Mm-hmm. And, um, that is what's right to do. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, in it, you know, you, you talk to people, you, you, you have some good theological points, Hey, you're going to be made one flesh. It's not a small thing. It's no. a big thing. Yeah. You know, there's a big reason why um, sex is supposed to be saved for marriage. Yeah. And you can kind of like defend it that way. Mm-hmm. But then, yeah, I, I didn't really get into the uh, too much of the hype trains of, of what to do. Like yeah. t-shirts or quips, you know, like, like a yeah. t- you know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. like a, a, I don't know, like shirts that talk about a person's virginity and stuff like that. It's like, bro. Virginity rocks. You know what I mean? No, like, like, so, like, yeah, I mean, like, what? Why don't we not wear that as a T-shirt? You know what I'm saying? That's a yeah. weird thing to do. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, it's like sure. it's like quasi judgmental to other people, and then also like, I don't know. I think they're trying to to rearticulate something that they might be embarrassed about to yeah. become a point of pride. Like mm-hmm. this, I take pride in this, yeah. which is cool. But um, I always had the mindset: teach the word, teach the gospel. And all the things are going to work themselves out mm-hmm. in that framework yeah. instead of just kind of doing like a hardcore special topics of just like, this is, we're going to talk about sexual ethics every week, you know what I'm saying? In, in youth <laughs> yeah. or whatever. So, but that was definitely there. Wild at Heart yeah. was like the book that like everybody read for yeah. all, all the men, all the boys. Yeah. We read, we read Wild at Heart. Uh-huh. I kissed dating goodbye. <laughs> I kissed dating goodbye. Uh-huh. I didn't, I didn't read it, but like a bunch of my friends were like, I'm not dating. I'm courting. We yeah. were courting. <laughs> like, bro, you're doing the same thing. You're just calling it a different. <laughs> it's the same name. thing. It's the same. Like, but I told her dad, like, it's like, dude, you're doing the same thing. <laughs> it was just, it was a confusing time. It was weird. Yeah. No, I agree. I think honestly, like my passion for this kind of topic was I got into college 
and I was talking with like friends and and stuff and and I realized kind of with a jarring (laughs) kind of understanding is that so many of us that are specifically and particularly those who were raised in the church or around the church yeah have a startling lack of understanding yeah. of a sexual theology. Like they know they're like, honestly the mechanics of it, any of it. And so, but there is a lot of shame. There's a lot of guilt. Mm-hmm. And I was hearing that over and over again. And I was like, what, like what is happening? Like, mm-hmm. I want to like dig into this. I want to, I want to, like, I want to get in there. Mm-hmm. And so I think, so what purity culture has become, right. Is, um, <laughs> associated strongly with, Sermons like, oh, a pastor has a rose, right? And then they oh. squish it up into their <laughs> oh, gosh, hands yeah. and then they're like, shush, shush, shush. and then they pick, pull, pick it out and they're like, do you see how it's like, it's still like, it's it was beautiful before, but now it's damaged. Mm-hmm. And that was this like sermon illustration that pastors were giving about like when people had yeah. premarital sex mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Or it was seemed to be more geared towards women too. Yeah, so, it so. was very much geared towards women. And this was a conversation surrounding a majority of women. And it has perpetuated stereotypes in the church of like, no, you ha- can't wear women can't wear two pieces at youth group, group youth group yeah. beach days. But like men can go shirtless like yeah. this belief that purity is on the responsibility in the shoulders of a woman to protect Mm-hmm. the purity of men yeah the way they would talk about it is um is do women have a gift mm-hmm. that they can give to their husband yes that they can uh protect and and give and the men to be to have integrity mm-hmm. need to respect that in women like yes. that was basically how to how to talk about it mm-hmm. but um but in that like i, I think it, it does speak towards one somewhat of an objectification of women like that yes. like there, there's this gift and then also it kind of leaves men off the hook. Like men yeah. um, don't have to save themselves because of a gift or whatever, but they save themselves out of just like having a personal integrity as being a man. Yes. And so it was just, it was different. It was different. Yeah. yeah. And so purity culture, honestly, it started with some of the best intentions. Like it, its intention was, and hear me when I say it, was to preserve the biblical understanding of not having sex before marriage. Mm-hmm. That is or a just biblical, outside of marriage. Like outside of marriage, period. Like yeah. there is... And I mean, part of my work, even in my master's thesis was um, where, how is sex mentioned in scripture? And when you find any reference to it, it's always in the context of a biblical covenant between a man and a woman. Always. Mm -hmm. It is never once found being affirmed in any other format, in any other context. Mm -hmm. It's described, but not as a positive ever. No, never. And and when it's outside of that context, it's sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. It's um, lust. It's all of these descriptions of things that are actually harmful. So when sex is used and is uh, described in scripture outside of marriage, it's all about the negative and the immorality and the dangers of it. Like the verses you get, like sex is a sin against your own body Mm -hmm. Um, and all that. And then when it's in covenant and it's in marriage, that's when it's positively described and it's all this stuff. Yeah. And so purity culture took a very positive thing, which was trying to preserve sex in the, proper context Mm -hmm. and went a little in the wrong direction for it Mm -hmm. and it became very much about shaming and guilt tripping and fear tactics it was fear mongering it was um don't have sex before marriage and it's gonna hurt and those were the two things you kind of got and that was your sex ed and youth group Mm -hmm. and that was all that anybody talked about and it was like oh okay um and then so people are terrified for their entire for their entire teenage years they're like oh my gosh i'm so scared of like what's gonna happen if i have like sex before marriage whatever and then i know a lot of people who actually were christians and then got married and then we're like um what do we do now Mm -hmm. because you've been told that this this thing is is negative that sex is is terrible and horrible and then you get married and all of a sudden you're like yay we can do it now Mm -hmm. but that doesn't change anybody's mindset so and also another effect i think is almost a reversal of it it was held at such a high esteem that's like, it's so awesome. It's the best thing you could ever experience, blah, 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 blah. Yep. And so like the expectations build up so like incredibly that when it's time, um, like you will fall off the expectation. Yes. You know what I mean? Like there's no way it can meet up to that. Yes. You've, 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 uh, you've fantasized it, um, making it the greatest experience you'll ever have <laughs> your whole entire in, life. In your yeah. entire life. That's yeah. Un- undue expectations were. Yeah. And so purity culture built this context and this culture of what we're more focused on what not to do. Mm-hmm. And it became, and this is how I described it is it became more about pursuing virginity than it was about pursuing purity. Mm. And it became more about what do we not do to make sure that we're not robbing our spouses <laughs> of something yeah. that they should have when we yeah, get yeah, married yeah. or that yeah. we're not, 
doing this, that, and the other thing. So, uh, so uh, what you're saying is that it's not that what they're saying is untrue. Mm-hmm. It's that the way they're focusing on it mm-hmm. and the way they're kind of guiding it in that discussion yeah. m- creates a lot of unhealthy uh, reactions and thinking about it. Yes, it, it does. And so now we have people who, and there's these like your damaged goods that like if you have sex before you're married, like you have nothing to offer your spouse. Mm-hmm. And all that kind of stuff I think has been so traumatizing for so, so, so many people. And even people who have like walked away from the church or people who have deconstructed along those lines. Yeah. This is a thing that they will point to Mm -hmm. often Mm -hmm. where they talk about how they were shamed and they were guilt tripped and they were unwelcomed and all of these things because they had either come to the Lord after they'd already engaged in Mm -hmm. premarital sex or that they had, um, done it and slipped up and mm-hmm. now it's been told to them that they are less valuable of a person that right. they are less whole right. that they have less to offer their spouse and it has done a lot of damage in this in this space of people who and it has made people feel like oh i'm less than because of something that i've done in my past so in a way purity culture is positioning a person's sexuality into their image of god yeah so like, so we like, we find our, our value inherently yeah. as image bearers, yeah. period. So like, no matter who you are in, right. in or outside of the kingdom, like, like you bear the image of God yeah. and that's, so you're inherently valuable. Yeah. But so what this does is it actually brings your grasp on your own sexuality, mm-hmm. um, determines your value, determines your worth. So it right. becomes a metric that people are evaluating people and not, yeah. and then therefore your, your image of God isn't totally inherent. Then. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that becomes really dangerous Mm -hmm. when we ascribe something in addition to, (laughs) Mm -hmm. oh, like you are so valued and and yours and the Lord loves you and all these things, except Mm -hmm. if you have sex before marriage, now you are a little less than, right. And you don't have it as much and you're not as whole as you could be. But that's not true. You're, you still completely display the image of God. You're still entirely valuable. Have you sinned and you need your repentance? Yes, Yes. That's part of it. But, but like, but we've sinned and re- need repentings from a lot more than a just lot, sexual sins, right? A lot more. So yeah, don't want to. And, and so I think what the, the, the fine line is we don't want to negate the importance mm-hmm. of wanting sexual purity Yeah. because, um, but then at the same time are pointing out when the way you talk about something can be damaging. Yeah. And so, uh, cause, cause it is youth pastors should not be teaching their youth that is just good, whatever. No. You know what I'm saying? Like, like absolutely they should not. totally be like, hey, save yourself for marriage, but like yeah. give a better theological context for yes. it that's helpful to them and, and help them understand it. Um, yes. Yes. And that's like my whole soapbox is like, I'm going to use it anyway, the deconstructing of traditional what purity culture has built mm-hmm. and taking the good, obviously, because there is good in it and, yeah. and the principles of it. And then actually adding on to it and creating a healthy view of sexuality in the church. Yeah. Um, because let's be honest, like it started on a good, on a good path. We were like, okay, we don't want to have sex before marriage. We don't want to have sex outside of marriage, that kind of thing. And then we can, so we can keep that, but mm-hmm. we need to destigmatize the shame and the guilt that has mm-hmm. been presented almost as a second, second hand part of that. Right. And cause I remember being, I'm being a teenager and being like told that like, the and i went to like a baptist right i've talked about this i went to like a baptist school and all that and it was like you have to wear like tank tops that are like three fingers wide or something because you are a stumbling block (laughs) for the men that are at this in this place yeah and you're like oh okay okay um awesome Mm -hmm. but then there's uh, there's never any like (laughs) same requirements for men for yeah. all that kind of stuff and so it's purity culture has created these sub parts where it's like oh if you're modest you're valuable uh-huh. if you're immodest you're not valuable if you are pure then you're valuable if you're impure you're no longer valuable but they're also defining what modesty looks like so so specifically <laughs> and very very specifically and then and then putting people in different situations i mentioned this one time but like you know um, I lived in Puerto Rico for a year when I was little, but like a yeah. um, bunch of family lives there and go back and stuff during the summertime. Like it's super hot and it's like a beach culture. So like people don't dress like as 
like somebody in the Pacific Northwest would. You right, know what I mean? As like, con- quote unquote conservatively yeah, as it may. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it doesn't mean that they're being um, immodest necessarily. Like there's a way to be immodest in that. Yeah. So like, so each each situation will define um, what modesty is in that. So so they're just basically taking a very specific um, contextual sense of modesty and, um, and applying it to everyone. And yeah. then like kind of hypocritically putting it on women um, mm-hmm. to preserve and which which then it creates um, like patterns of gender norms. It creates yeah. that in people as a, at a young age. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It makes men as the sexual aggressors yeah. and women as the sexual receivers yeah. um, in, in pretty much all social contexts. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So men need to tamp down that internal, infernal roar of sexuality yeah. that they have. Mm-hmm. And women, women need to not <laughs> make it worse on them. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Like, like that kind of a deal. Well, because even like in my like research and stuff and the things that I was looking at is, because obviously we have the, it is predominantly negative enough of, an, of its effect towards women and things that women experience. But the reduction of men down to their sexual impulses, I think, is so unfair. It is. It's bad for. <laughs> this is where it can get bad for men, is because then the expectation is for, oh, men have this kind of weird double standard. One, to be a good man, you should have a ferocious sexual appetite. Yes. But to be a really good man is you should have that and control it. And control it and do nothing about it. Yes. <laughs> You're like, oh. <laughs> so, so, like, so if you don't have a ferocious sexual appetite, you're not quite manly no and if you don't control it if you do have you're it, not a good man then you're not a good man it's just you're, you're just like you can't win in this situation no, uh, it's setting up men to not win purity culture is a lose-lose yeah to me like men are either too like too sexual or they're not sexual enough <laughs> yeah. and then women are either stumbling blocks or prudes and they're too, too sex <laughs> they're too sexualized yeah in every way and so purity culture is unfair to everyone mm-hmm. which is why i think that we need to be about dismantling it in in a certain degree and even like there is so much research done that i included in my thesis about the fact that purity culture doesn't even work it just doesn't Mm -hmm. and i was and there are a couple of statistics that i'll include and things in the show notes but like just very briefly one 82 percent of people who pledged deny ever pledging <laughs> five years <laughs> after nice. they they know ne- they no. <laughs> they're like never mind <laughs> yeah, okay all right so for most of them what that was a joke yeah most of them deny even doing it 60 percent of <laughs> people who've pledged in abstinence to some degree or another um broke that pledge within a year mm. <laughs> so there's no difference and then there is a like 0.1 percent difference between christians who pledged and non-Christians who pledged <laughs> nice. of who went and actually had s- sex anyway. So there is actually no difference yeah. statistically between Christians who pledged to abstinence and non-Christians who Marginal pledged abstinence. Best, yeah. There is very little difference. And so the statistics of purity culture and what they tried to implement in order to uh, make this effective ways of preaching abstinence and whatever mm-hmm. didn't even work. And there's so many like sub (laughs) statistics and stuff about that, but one, it didn't work. And then (laughs) two, it actually became very damaging and like over, it's like over 70% of abstinence only education promoted in schools, which is actually the predominant sexual education in schools is still abstinence only and Mm -hmm. nothing else. Um, teaches false information to Mm -hmm. some degree or not enough information. And so not only do we have a bunch of Christians and uh, of who, and I'm speaking to specifically Christians. Obviously, this affects non-Christians as well. But Christians, we have a bunch of people who, one, are feel shame and guilt around ins- surrounding sex. And then, two, they've been taught to just say no, to just not have it. And so they're actually stunted in their sexual education at all. Mm-hmm. So they actually have no understanding about the mechanics, the yeah. emotional, the biblical, nothing. They have no understanding of sex except for the fact that they shouldn't have it before they're married. And that's the problem with the abstinence teaching. It's not the fact of teaching abstinence. No. It's it's that you're teaching it without giving a full view, yeah, like of of what's going on. Yes, and it's the both and like right. have teach about abstinence and advocate for that, but also talk about these other things, mm-hmm. like talk about sexual education, talk about the risks, talk about birth control, like talk about all of those things. Because in a Christian school, talk a, about the theology. To, that's talk about it. the theology of it. I mean, friends, we have Song of Songs in the Bible. <laughs> 
And I talk about this hugely. It's like that is an entire book. It's it literally classified as erotic poetry. <laughs> It's classified as erotic literature, friends. Like there, there's places where, like, uh, like it was illegal to read it. You couldn't read, yes, <laughs> like, or like, like a whole day. portion of like Jewish boys were not allowed to read that portion of scripture until they were over eighteen. It's funny. You were like not allowed straight up. Like there is a whole book of the Bible about it. So I would challenge that, like, if the if God felt it so important mm-hmm. to be included in scripture, yeah, then it's an important part of our lives and that it's not something in that entire book. There is no demonization of sex. There is no demonization of a sexual relationship. Like there is nothing negative about right. the sexual relationship between the two, the man and the woman in song of songs that, and some people call it song of Solomon. There's debating on whether or not Solomon wrote it. So I'm calling it song of songs, blah, 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 blah. But uh, th- so there's this whole thing. And even like purity culture took that one step of, and I think this has become what's been so unfortunate and so dangerous is we as people took something sex that God called good and we called it bad. Yeah. That's, I mean, there's a major point there is, um, in Genesis one, the first commandment God ever gives to people after he creates them, be fruitful and multiply and multiply. Now that isn't just, uh, sexually. No, you're fruitful in life and all this stuff. But and if you don't want kids or don't have kids, that doesn't mean that you're not right. fulfilling there's other your ways, mandates. There's other ways to be fruitful, but like, but it does include that. Yeah. God made humans sexual beings. Yes. And, um, and when he's talking about be fruitful and multiply, it does mean multiply also in your progeny. Yes. It does multiply, multiply in every aspect of it. Yes. And the, the blessings of it in Abraham that you will have, you know, descendants and all this kind of yeah. stuff. Like obviously, um, sexuality is a part of this. Yeah. And guys, Sex was in the garden. Sex was in the garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. The perfect relationship with people and God and the creation before we entered sin into the world, sex was there. Mm -hmm. Sex was in God's perfect design, friends. It was in there in its right context, obviously. And that's what we're kind of working on the assumption of. In an appropriate covenant. In its appropriate covenantal relationship. But it was there. Adam and Eve had the uh, the proto- covenant like the 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 main covenant we think about is the sinai covenant the mosaic covenant but like noah before that and adam and eve before that the adamic uh covenant is kind of like how things were supposed to be yes and then all the other covenants are like kind of how to get us back to that yes you know what i mean yes so so that's good yeah and it's like the whole thing like God and 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 it really and this kind of blew my mind even while I was reading and researching and stuff and there are, Stanley Grant says this a lot like there's different people that I'll again list in the show notes for you um who were like people are made in the image of God and in the image of God there is some sexuality to that mm-hmm. like God understands <laughs> our sexuality and God understands sex and that is to some degree a reflection of him and his he didn't really, do it by accident like, no like, like he, it's all very intentional like we didn't he didn't like oops i ended up making humans like sexual humans to, beings to, that's to, to sexual beings to procreate like that's like literally how that's he made us, why yeah. that's how he made us and we're a reflection uh, and, and all these things of him and i think right. that that is such a huge issue of purity culture is the fact that we have demonized something that god intended to for be good holy and good and yeah. to be holy and to be um something that we engage in in this covenantal context and obviously everything in its context. And that's why in the scriptures, when it talks about sexual immorality and fleeing from sexual immorality mm-hmm. and lust and the, and the dangers of all that kind of stuff. And we see that he is trying to keep us in this alignment. So obviously we're always pointing back to how we were supposed to be at the beginning. Sex is supposed to be in a covenant as it was in the garden, as it was between Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm. And even you see in various places in scripture, like sex outside of its context is negative receives a negative consequence Mm -hmm. like david and bathsheba like sex outside of its context and their child dies like the rape of various women and like there is consequences that come out of that Mm -hmm. like all of these different contexts in which sex is enacted outside of where it's supposed to be and outside of this covenantal relationship there is punishment and it's always and they always lead to destruction they always lead to destruction always that's really good and i want to talk about a point um before we wrap up because i think I want to do, I want to talk about this point and then I think Megan I think it would be good if we close with you just telling us you know how the church should should respond like yeah. what are what are some actionable things to do but yeah. before that this is something that I thought about a bunch of times and I think part of the reason 
people have so much struggle with um, sexuality today mm -hmm. is because of the changing social climates. Like this, like like there's <laughs> sociological points and things that I think yeah. people don't like totally grasp all the time. Yeah. And so so check this out. We in in the last 50 years, our life expe expectancy has grown tremendously. Mm -hmm. So like, like in, in even more so like right now on, on average, people uh, live to be 79 years old in 1950, people live to be 69 years old and you can go, that's 10 year difference in lifespan and you can go further back. Yeah. Um, and it, it just gets, it gets smaller, smaller and smaller, and smaller. Yeah. Throughout history, whenever people, both men and women reached a, a state of adolescence and puberty kicked in biologically, they were now sexual beings to, yeah. to, to procreate and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They actually acted out on it pretty shortly thereafter. Right. Uh, like in the Bible days, people got married. Like we got till 35. <laughs> Keep it, got get it going. You're middle aged by the time you're 15. And that's, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a big deal. So like, like, so if you have, if you have like in, in Jesus's day where people are living to be 50, yeah. like max, Mm -hmm. and they get married when they're 15 yeah. and start working in their field and trade and stuff like that. That's just a couple of years after, after your uh, sexual organs have kicked in right. the way they do yeah. in puberty and stuff. So like, so basically you had f urges and feelings and you were able to immediately act on them. Yes. Now we're told to get like, we socially start getting married way later. Yeah. We live longer. Yeah. <laughs> if you're living to be 80, and um, you, you getting I got married when I was 25. Yeah. People getting married, 25 is a pretty common age now. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, the, the marrying age in 1950 for women was, or 1960 mm -hmm. for women was 20. That's no. the average age. Wow. Average was so 20. You, there was a lot of younger and older. Yeah, there was, there was there younger too. than that too. <laughs> and, um, and the average for men was 22. Yeah. And so, so that's crazy significant. And today um, for women, it's 26 and for men it's 28. Average first yeah. time, first time being married. So it doesn't like being remarried. Doesn't, yeah, it doesn't. But like, so think about it. If a mm -hmm. woman's average is 20 years old and we know this in the 1950s, women were getting married at 16, 17. And that wasn't yeah. like unusual 15 even. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, there's a story of like Jerry Lee Lewis and he got in trouble for like, uh, like, like, it was in the papers and stuff that he married his cousin and, um, and he was like, and he married his 13 year old cousin. He was like 21 or something. Ooh. And then, um, he was like, no, -uh, she was 15. And that was like, his, that was his <laughs> like response. Better, like, oh, okay. Oh, that's fine. Then. That's, that's better. But like, obviously it's a different time. People yeah. didn't live as long. That's all going on. Yeah. Also, teenagers didn't exist until no. the le uh, after World War II, yeah. which is a crazy thing to think about. Like you were a kid and then you were an adult. That's it. You, <laughs> went, you went from there. Um, you went from being a child in grade school and then working and being married and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Now we have. Um, and, and the reason why was because all the fathers went to war and the mothers had to go to, uh, work and yeah. stuff like that. And we had all these campaigns to do that. Um, uh, and then a lot of youth were left at home. And this is the first time that we ever got like a youth culture of people trying to figure out their place in the world yeah. kind of on their own. Yeah. And then they ended up getting rebellious and that's why they started listening to rock and roll, listen to Elvis. And we get all of our yeah. fun little rebellious periods and then hippie love periods yeah. and then our psychedelic periods all and then that, our purity culture <laughs> all that comes all that comes after that and um so teenagers the advent of teenagers the delayed adolescence mm -hmm. now um you're supposed to just be pure and all the way up until marriage and if you're going on averages that means 26 for women and 28 for men yeah so statistically that, you're waiting five six years longer yeah and than so, you were previously like than the last 50 years and if you're 28 year old male that means you're waiting, uh, man, math, 15 <laughs> years on your sexual impulses and desires right. to act on them. Mm -hmm. That's act, that's biologically unfair. It is. Uh, yeah. It's, you know what I mean? It's a very different and so, reality. And, 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 a, and a female, close, 15 years too. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like, that's that's kind of, I think that reality just is, is something that we need to think about. And I, I don't think yeah. it's a license to go and be like, oh, therefore go be sexually active no. or whatever. And I was a youth pastor for 11 years and I always taught, you know, um, abstinence and, and, um, and waiting to marriage yeah. and stuff. But I try to give the whole theological context of it yeah. and, um, and what it is. And like, hey, this is a greater challenge yeah. than it was in the past. And yeah. there's reasons why. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't because God calls us to be holy. And yes. if we're, if we're going to be holy, it's going to be not just in our sexual 
spirituality. <laughs> yes. It's going to be in all things. Yes. But that is part of it. Yeah. And so, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, well, what, do you, what do you think of that? Like that, that kind of, that sociological factors. Yeah. No, I think it's huge. And I think also that's something that purity culture hasn't helped on is the fact that everyone pretty much starts to get and develop some sort of a sex drive by the time they're like 12, 13. Mm -hmm. And then when that is shamed and silenced and suppressed, mm -hmm. then you have these people Just who are decades like, of ramifications. Decades. Oh my gosh. Of people who are like, I have never once expressed, expressed any sexual anything in, in my entire life. And they're mm -hmm. 25. Yeah. And so I think this is something that then I'm, I think that the church needs to be better at in engaging is we need to stop demonizing sex drives because everyone's got them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we need to not, we're not against sex and a sex drive and sexuality. Like that is not, we're not against that. Mm -hmm. but, it needs to be properly situated. But it needs to be properly situated. Everything in its time and in its place. Mm -hmm. But we need to stop like terrorizing teenagers and being that they're scared of their own body, that they're scared of their own desires of things that are perfectly natural and actually how God made us. And also weirdly glorifying it to, at the same time to unmet expectations it's and like stuff. this weird fetishization of virginity mm -hmm. of all of this kind of stuff and it's like i know and and I, this is why i think that we need to shape reshape our mindset is it needs to not be about virginity it needs to be about purity right because i know people who yeah you're not having sex but you're six years into a deep porn addiction mm -hmm. i that is not pure babe no it's like, the same thing yeah. that is the exact same so it's like purity is a pursuit of heart soul mind mm -hmm. and body it's we, better I, I think it's better to think of it as holiness instead yes of, like, like it's it's not about yeah we're called to be pure and holy purity is part of holiness yes but like holiness is the theological context of like of what it is yes being being set apart as an image bearer that that is is emulating christ you know yes. what i'm saying like like what all that entails yeah and purity is part of this exactly so it's like you're not because you don't get credit for being addicted to pornography when you get married because you didn't have sex mm -hmm. like it's it doesn't <laughs> like that's just a d substituting one issue for another and right. so i think that's what we've done is like we've made sure that oh well if you didn't actually have the act of sex outside of marriage you're good to go but they're but they're still acting but out on their impulses because we're not talking about biblical sexuality right we're not talking about a biblical view of sex in all of its contexts mm -hmm. heart soul mind spirit and so we have a bunch of people who aren't doing the thing or being like, where's like the line? Te te technical or where's the or, line? Yeah. Like, ooh, what's the, how far can we go? And right. I'm like, that's not right. what we're arguing here. Right. What, we need to not be like, oh, how far can we go? How good, how, how, what can we do before we cross the line? It's like, why are we doing it? Because I'm submitting my sexuality at the foot of the cross. Right. Because this is not about what I owe my husband or I owe my wife. This is about what between you and the Lord. Yeah. And I, and that's why I think abolishing this, you owe your husband, you owe your wife, your virginity. No, you don't. You, your first, you are in, you are accountable to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the same way that if you lose your virginity or whatever outside of marriage, I believe that we have a God who can restore that to, <laughs> and, and forgive and repent and reconcile. And I far from it from me to limit what the Lord can restore. Mm hmm. And so I think that we need to really be intentional as Christians, as the church, as all these things of changing our language in the way that we discuss yeah. sex, that we need to be willing to talk about it. Churches need to be getting down and being willing to have these conversations because kids are going to find out. Yeah. Teenagers are going to find out. Young adults, people are going to get their information somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And if we are called to be the voice of, we should be at the forefront. Then we of need to be at the forefront the, of these yeah. conversations. We need to be at the forefront. We need to be having hard conversations. Pastors, you need to be willing to be educated in these topics. Mm -hmm. You need to be willing to have these conversations. You need to be willing to make efforts and engaging because you need to go there first. Mm -hmm. There is a holy calling on these people. If you have a passion about it and you're educated in it, like speak up. Let's get these conversations going. We need to destroy the stigma of th that sex is negative and that sexuality is negative and we need to reframe the way that we think mm -hmm. so that sex is a conversation that we're having in church and we're explaining it. We're talking about how it fits into scripture, what God right. has called us to, not saying don't. Right. Because that's not going to get us anywhere. It hasn't gotten us I anywhere. I think um, parents will have fears that like, if I open the conversation, yes, then the kids will be sexual. They'll, they'll do things that I don't want them to do. Yes. The truth of the matter is, by not having a conversation, they're going to have a heck of a lot more confusion and mm -hmm. shame and, uh, and misunderstanding. Yes. So it's better to have that conversation and then just, and just to be in the upright situation. Yes. The, the truth of the matter is like 
a lot of the issues that we deal with in the church and stuff like that, it's not even the actual belief or the actual um, action, yeah. the actions that take. It's it's how you understand them, how you approach them, and a lot of it is being open and forthright. Yeah, I think what a lot of um, uh, young people want, millennials for sure, Gen Z for sure, is, is just not to have just a base rule, just like do this because I said so. Yes. They don't want that. No. They want to have a conversation about it and it, it needs to like kind of like resonate and make sense. And yes. when it does, then they can then they can get down with it. And, yes. and I think I think that's a human that's a human reality. Yeah. And I think so as a church, it's our responsibility to open those conversations, to bring them in, and to know that like is is it is it better to make that decision in the broad daylight or in the in the in the darkness on on your own? Yeah, you know what I mean. It's it's probably better to build accountability structures before mm-hmm. you get even into into things yes. because you have a full understanding of what it's all about. Yeah, and in this society, like the average age of like exposure to like sexual material is like thirteen. Yeah. So it's getting younger and younger as the culture continues to become sexually saturated. Mm-hmm. And so you like parents, you're not you don't have more time, you have less. And it's, you gotta talk to them, and it's okay. Like you don't need to lay out how it is like the first conversation you have, like, but I, you, the power of being willing to be a place that they can ask. Yeah. The power of being willing to be a place where your kid can come mm-hmm. or a pastor where your congregant can come or a youth student can come, like be a safe place for them to ask questions Yeah. because you may not know all the answers and it may feel awkward, but if they don't, if you're not making yourself available, they will go find it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And I think we can all say that we probably don't want them to find out from their peers or from experience or, the internet. or from the internet. Yeah. So be risk being that safe space, risk mm-hmm. being the awkward conversation that you have with your kid, risk the awkward sermon that you give, risk it because you will see the fruit of that. It, in, the, in, the, in the long run, they will have appreciated having that conversation yes. in that safe space than to have it in, in an awkward place later on. Exactly. It's so much easier to know beforehand than it is to heal from what happened after. Mm-hmm. And so I think we all des- <laughs> I think everyone deserves to have a fighting chance to not have to heal from bad experience when they can take the knowledge yeah. and the wisdom that is given to them on, on the front end. Okay. And yeah. you know, I think that that's something that we need to be committed to doing as church, as pastors, as Christians, um, cause I think that's what, I think that's what the Lord would want from us. <laughs> well, good stuff, Megan. Um, ooh, I think, ooh, uh, ooh. people got it. You got to check out her, uh, her dissertation. She, she went to London school of theology and them, 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 uh, the British, Brits. British folks be calling their master's thesis dissertations. They too. do call it dissertations. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, but, uh, but still like it sounds, uh, <laughs> it sounds fascinating and, uh, I'm going to have to check that out and, uh, yeah, I hope other people do too. Hey, I think you'll like it. <laughs> all right. As you guys know, this episode and um, all of our episodes are, are sponsored by the School of Theology and Ministry at Life Pacific University, of which Megan is now part of the staff. Ooh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. So, um, so a lot in store in this season. We've got some really great guests coming up and some really important topics. So hopefully this gets you. Uh, this topic was good for you and, um, and helpful. And uh, yeah, hit us up on social media. Let us know what you want us to talk about and we will make it happen. We'll see you next week, friends. Bye.